We've come a long way on our journey of portfolio risk management and coding that capability in MQL5. Today's episode reaches a critical milestone as I finalize the code to calculate the value at risk metric for any number of assets, but also some breaking news for users of MT4 about how all of the code I've covered so far in this series can also be used in MQL4. Stay tuned. DarwinX is a UK FCA regulated broker and asset manager on a mission to disrupt the financial trading, investing and asset management industries. As a trader, you'll benefit from cost-effective market access via multiple trading platforms and APIs. These enable trading and investing in any US stock, over 60 of the most liquid futures contracts, FX and CFDs. You can even diversify your portfolio by buying and selling other traders' strategies as investable assets themselves. So, if all of that sounds interesting, learn more by clicking on the link top right now or find further links in the description right below. Now back to today's tutorial. More on that news about using the risk management module in MT4 later on, but for now, let's focus on the primary topic of today, which is coding multi-asset value at risk. So let's now return to the code that we were using last time for the calculation of value at risk for just two assets and take a look at the changes that I've now implemented in order to extend that capability to any number of assets. So we'll start by looking at the calculate VAR method, which you should be familiar with by now. And the first thing I've done is convert the standard deviation of returns array to a dynamic array. So I'm not specifying how many values this will hold at the time I'm declaring it. And then I'm using the array resize function to size that standard deviation array to the same size as the assets array that gets passed in to the function. And this can contain any number of assets. And then with the simple addition of a for loop, I can now set the standard deviation of returns for each and every one of those assets that are being passed into this function. And then there's just some standard diagnostics here in the event that there's a problem running that function. Now, it's a similar process for the correlation coefficient calculations. However, here, because we're calculating that correlation coefficient between the individual assets, we actually need two nested for loops. But in exactly the same way, we calculate that correlation value for each and every combination of the two assets. One delivered through asset A loop, which is this one, and the other delivered by the asset B loop, which is this one. And so by nesting them in this way ensures we get every single combination. And in the same way, we output an alert if there's any issue with any of those calculations. Now, you'll start to get the idea here that this is effectively the same code, but contained within these for loops. And exactly the same is the case for the calculation of the nominal monetary values where we again declare our dynamic array, resize that for the number of assets passed in, and then iterate through a loop in order to perform the same calculation that we've seen previously. There's one additional thing here, and that is the calculation of a portfolio nominal value. So each time we go through the loop, you can see here, we increment that value, which starts at zero, with the nominal value of each and every asset that's being held in the portfolio. And as I've explained before, we use the absolute value of that because these values will be negative if they are short, but from the perspective of an overall portfolio value, we need to sum those values up using absolute values. Next, we need to deal with the weights of those positions, which of course we can now do now that we know what the individual monetary values are. And so here we simply take the individual nominal value of each asset and divide that by the overall portfolio value. And so all of these values, if you were to sum them up, would sum to one. 
Now, notice that we're not using the absolute value of the nominal monetary value here. That's intentional. We need to retain that sign so that the portfolio standard deviation calculation works because we need to look at the correlation between both long positions and short positions. And if we're holding two positions in different directions, that correlation coefficient needs to be reversed. And so by retaining the sign here ensures that that happens. Now, the way that I thought it was going to be easiest to perform the portfolio standard deviation calculation was to split up the overall calculation into two parts, which I'm just calling part one and part two. So it's worthwhile bringing up the calculation that we looked at last time to explain what I mean by part one and part two. Part one is the top line here. So it's the weight squared of each position multiplied by the standard deviation of return squared. And if you remember, we will have one of these terms for each position we're holding in the portfolio. So if we're holding five positions, we'll have five of these. And then the second part here relates to this second line, which includes the correlation coefficients between individual positions. And so if you remember, if we do have three positions, we'll have three of these terms. But if we have four positions, then we'll have six of these. And I explained in a previous episode what the geometric formula was to know how many terms we'll have for a set number of positions. So do refer to that if this doesn't make sense. And it's useful to know that in the description below the video, there's a link there to the playlist for this series where you can get access to all of the previous episodes in order. But just have this in mind now as we go through the calculation here. So again, we need two loops, and that's because of the fact that we're going to look at the correlation coefficient between two assets. But the first part of the calculation actually takes place just in the first loop here. And this is fairly self-explanatory. We're just summing up all of the values for each position of the weight squared multiplied by the standard deviation squared. And so if we have four positions, this loop will execute this four times and give us the four terms we need. But then in this subloop here, this is where we need to run a number of times for each asset. And there's a clause here which says only do this if asset B loop is greater than asset A loop. And that's so that we don't double count. So when we're looking at the correlation coefficients, we don't want to count asset A with asset B and asset B with asset A the other way around. And so this condition here takes care of that. What it also does is make sure that we never compare, for example, a position with itself because we're using greater than here, not greater than or equal to. And so then the second part of the calculation effectively takes the form that we saw here. So it's two multiplied by the two weights that we're looking at, the correlation coefficient between those positions, and then the standard deviation of each of those. And so that you can see we have the two here, we have the two weights, the two standard deviations, and then the correlation coefficient here. And obviously the array values use the values from the two loops that we are currently executing. And then when both of those loops have completed, it's then a relatively easy step to just take the square root of part one plus part two, which gives us the final calculation here for the portfolio standard deviation. And once we have that, the calculation for the value at risk is identical to what we've seen previously. We have our z-score, and we're using 1.65 for this, multiplied by the portfolio standard deviation that we've just calculated here, multiplied by the portfolio nominal value. And then we simply return from the function because this is set up as a public property of the class, and so that can be accessed by the calling function. 
And so that represents the final change that we're going to make to our portfolio risk management module. There's nothing else that we need to do in this series. That's a completed module ready to be used in a variety of ways that we will look at. So if I come back now to the calling function here, instead of having just two positions that we had previously and their respective position sizes here, I've now created an array with four positions. But of course, because of how we've coded this, this could actually be any number of positions. Remember that any negative value like this one represents a short trade, whereas positive represent long trades. So in the same way as we did before, we're going to call the calculate VAR method, pass it the asset names array, pass it the asset lot sizes array. And as long as that executes without any errors, then we'll output that information to the user interface. So let's now compile that to make sure that we don't receive any errors. And now if we come over to MT5 and run the value at risk multi-position script, we'll keep the default values for the standard deviation periods and correlation coefficient periods. And you can see that the value at risk for the four positions that we specified in the script is 148.44. And because my account is in British pounds, this will be a pound value. But I always find it reassuring when we make such substantial changes to code in the way that we have here, just to double check that things are still being calculated as they were previously for two positions. And so in order to do that, it's a relatively simple process to come back here. And instead of doing this for four positions, I'm going to revert back to two positions, but of course I'm still using the code for any number of assets. And so now I can compare the value that I get from this to the value that we had previously from the two asset script. And hopefully if everything's working correctly, they should be the same. So if I just compile that, come over to my two asset script here, which has the same assets and the same position sizes, as you can see. So we'll compile both of those. Return to MT5. So if we run this first for the multi-position version, we can see that this is 292 and 10 pence. And so if we just remember this value, 292.1, run this one, we get 292.1. Now, although this value is exactly the same here, sometimes you will get a slightly different value. And that's because of course, things are changing between running those two scripts. So the price of each of those assets is changing, which has an impact on the nominal value calculations and so on. But that gives me the reassurance that the fairly major code changes we made by adding all of those loops hasn't introduced any bugs. So you'll be glad to know that we've now reached the point where I can start to explain some examples of how you might use this type of information in order to help make better trading decisions. So effectively putting everything that we've learned so far into use. And you might remember that I covered a topic fairly early on in the series called incremental VAR and looking at how the value at risk changes with the addition of a new position or how it would change if we did open a new position. And so we're going to use the code that we've looked at so far to give us that incremental value at risk. And so we can use that then amongst other things to help inform whether a new position should be opened or not. Episode 19 looks at the theory of this in the context of everything we've learned during the series. And then in the following episode, I actually code this in MQL, not by changing the risk management module, we've completed that now, just by changing the way that the script consumes that module. And if you remember from the very beginning of this episode, I also talked about how this MQL5 code can also be used in MT4. 
And so in episode 21, I'm going to dedicate a full episode to showing you exactly what you need to do if you want to use this code within your MetaTrader 4 environment. So I'd encourage you to subscribe to the DarwinX YouTube channel so that when any of those new episodes get released, you'll get a notification telling you. But now until next time, trade safe.